Okay, class, settle down, settle down. Welcome back. I am Professor Clark and Hyman. Does anyone remember what we talked about last week? Ooh, 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 ooh. I know, I know, I know. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You talked about how sin is bad. We looked at the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and how sin can be deceitful and it challenges God and His Word and it has all these empty promises but it's not worth the consequences to go into it. Wow, great job. So this week we're going to continue that conversation. Oh man, why do we have to talk about sin? Can't we talk about like football or something? Yeah, I mean, what's the big deal anyway? I mean, sin is fun. And if something's fun, it must be good, right? I mean, why would God say not to do fun stuff? Yeah, like OMJ. Now, now, class. We have to learn about it, so that way we can look for it. God has great promises in our life, but we must be receptive to hearing His truth and His instructions. We can learn from Israel. When they were in the wilderness, they hardened their heart to God and His instructions. And therefore, it made their life a lot more difficult. So today, if God is speaking to us, we must not harden our heart to His instructions. Because we have to remember, God is good and sin is bad. Okay? How's everybody? God is good, is he not? Mm, he's good. My name is David Petrelli. I'm one of the pastors here all the time. That's right. And uh, go ahead and roll the video, please. <laughs> My dad wanted me to have everything that everybody else had. I think the first thing that he ever bought me was a football. And I was very young, and uh, he didn't know a lot about it. He came from the old country. And, uh, I mean, we tried to pass it and throw it and kick it, and we couldn't do it, and it was very discouraging for him and for me. And uh, almost, we almost quit. And, and finally, we had a, a nice enough neighbor came over and put some air in it. And what a, <laughs> what a difference. Well, our answer to My our dad sin wanted me to have everything that everybody else had. I think. Thank you. Our answer to our sin problem is just that simple. Okay. And so um, this week uh, we are going to be in Hebrews chapter three, beginning of verse seven. Uh, this passage is a sermon on Psalm ninety-five. So we're, I'm going to preach a sermon uh, of a sermon. And it's designed to remind us of Numbers 13 through 14, the story of one of the most significant failures in God's people's history. And it is the Jewish symbol of disobedience. And it is God's people's response at Kadesh when they were going to go into the promised land or supposed to go in. It's a call to avoid what is basically the root of all sin. The deception that causes us to turn away from God in order 
to conduct our lives by his own leading is the root of all sin. And we're going to look at sin in this foundational power. It means we're not going to talk about pornography. We're not going to talk about greed or lying, rage or hate or slander or gossip or theft or disobedience to our parents or cheating. We're going to talk about the deceptive power of sin that causes us to turn away from God in the midst of his provision. And so in Hebrews 3, beginning in verse 7, it says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation, and I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared in my oath in anger that they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. For we have come to share Christ if we indeed hold to our original conviction firmly to the very end. As just has been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they that heard and rebelled? Were they not all that Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that we are not able to enter, or they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you have fallen short of it, for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. So God understands that it's difficult for us to steer our life by His direction. So the topic here of sin and what God wants us to know about sin from the book of Hebrews in this passage is not about our individual sins, but about the deceptiveness of sin that causes us to turn our back on God in the midst of His provision. And so this is, a, like I said, a sermon on Psalm 95, and I'm going to read Psalm 95 to you. It's not very long. It says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. And in his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. And the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Today, if you would only hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah and as you did that day at Massah in the wilderness where your ancestors tested me, they tried me, even though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation, and I said, these are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared in my in oath, in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And so you can see that the writer of Hebrews quotes this passage, and he says, and he begins, the Holy Spirit says... 
So he's quoting something that took place a long time ago, but he doesn't say the Holy Spirit said. He says the Holy Spirit says because the Holy Spirit is speaking and talking now as I bring forth the Scripture to our remembrance, it is brought from the past to the present. So what was spoken then becomes immediately relevant for us now and today because God's Word is a living Word. And so God is speaking now. The Holy Spirit is speaking now. And this whole passage here is talks about when the Israelites are at Kadesh. God says, okay, I want you to go and explore the land. And Pastor Andy talked about this. And so they go and they explore the land. Twelve guys go and explore the land. And they come back and they go, the land is awesome. This place is great. There's plentiful um, things to eat. The harvest is good. The soil is good. We even think the Detroit Lions could win in this land. <laughs> this place is awesome. But there are big people there. And they're strong, and they've fortified their cities, and they're ready for any attack. So two people, Caleb and Joshua, say, hey, God said this is our land. We can take it. Let's go. The other ten said, we don't like this idea, and so they start the rumor mill. These people are huge. We don't want to do it. If you go into battle, bud, you're dead. Your family's probably dead too. I don't think it's a good idea. And they start spreading this throughout the camp. And then the camp says, hey, we don't like this idea. Moses has done it again. Let's stone him. God says, <clears throat> I'm tired of these people. Get out of the way. I'm going to kill them all. Moses says, no, no, no. Don't do that, please. I don't want to start over. Look. If you do this, the nations around are going to say, well, this God delivered his people, and then he couldn't take them to where he wanted to, so he just killed them to save face. Now, understand, God isn't sitting here listening to Moses going, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that, okay? All right? But Moses is praying. And then Moses says something. He, there's, there's a passage in Scripture where this happens before. Moses says, look, you have to go with us. I'm not taking this people any further. I want to see your glory. And God says, fine. You sit behind this rock. I'm going to pass by. I'm going to let you see my backside. And as God goes by, he says, the Lord God, gracious and loving. And then Moses quotes this back to God at this time. And he says, you are the Lord God. Gracious and loving. This is what I heard from your own mouth when I saw your glory. And God says, they are forgiven, but they are not going to this promised land. And this is the symbol of disobedience for the Israelite people. And this is in the midst of provision, right? They saw everything in Egypt. They saw all the plagues. They went and they put the blood on the doorhouse and their firstborn lived, but no one else's did. They got to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh has second thoughts, and so the army's barreling down on them. They got the sea of reeds in front of them. They got uh, the, the uh, Egyptians behind them, and they're going, great. Thanks a lot, Moses. We had, it was good in Egypt. I don't know why you thought it was so bad. It was good in Egypt, and now we're doomed. And God parts the Red Sea, and they walk over on the Red Sea. And we've talked about water from the rock. We've talked about water that was made pure by throwing a log in it. We've talked about the manna and the quail, God's provision. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. They had everything they needed, even though they were in a wilderness and in a difficult place. And God brings them to this spot after seeing all of this, 
and having all of his provision, and they reject him. They reject him. So in their trials and their difficulties in building, being in the wilderness, there's great provision, and they turn their backs on God, refusing to steer their lives by his direction. Unbelief is not, in this passage, a lack of faith or trust. This is so important to understanding this text. Unbelief in this passage is not a complete lack of faith or trust. It is a refusal to believe, to believe God that leads to a turning away from God in a deliberate act of rejection of what he is doing in your life. Unbelief and turning away reflect the same disposition. And as a matter of fact, in this passage here, the Greek text makes it pretty clear because there's a play on words. Unbelief and turning away. And so, apisteus ento aspitein. Unbelief, aspiteus, apastein, N-A, sorry, I didn't decline it, um, is turning away. These two words that sound very similar are designed to hook them together so that we understand that unbelief and turning your back on God are the same basic thing. And he says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that you do not have an unbelieving heart. The Holy Spirit is speaking now, and it's applicable to us. Be careful that we do not have an unbelieving heart, a heart in the midst of God's provision that rejects his direction because it's too difficult or it seems impossible. We are called in this passage to help each other by encouraging each other This is not the sweet encouragement of, oh, things are going to be all right. We love you. You just continue on. That's not the encouragement that's being talked about here. This is the nitty-gritty that comes from being involved with each other and having deep enough relationships that we grant each other authority in our relationships to speak. So, um, I was a worship pastor at a church in the Chicagoland area, and there was this guy named Tree, because he was like, I don't know, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, something like that, skinny as a rail, and um, he, uh, he worked for Youth for Christ, but he was, he was also an amateur disc golf champion, so... Um, Disc golf is basically you golf with Frisbees and you throw it in a basket and they have courses and everything. There's actually a professional disc golf association where people make a living off this. And Tree was an amateur, but he was so good that he often won national professional events. And he couldn't take any money. He just took a lot of T-shirts and other stuff because he was an amateur. But he was good. Now, I like Frisbee, but I like ultimate Frisbee, which is kind of a combination frisbee football and I'm fairly good at it and um, so Tree says you need to learn how to do disc golf I said all right I got a frisbee he says nope you got to go buy frisbees so you got a special you got a driving frisbee that you do off the tee you got a chipping frisbee that you when you're close and you got a putting frisbee 
So I got my three Frisbees, and he's going to teach me how to do this. So we get to the first tee, and Tree throws it, and it's like perfect. I mean, he just, he almost got a hole in one. And I throw it, and it goes, and it's looking great for about 75 yards, and then it just goes into the woods. I'm like, dang. And Tree's response is, well, you didn't want to do that. <laughs> Thanks, Tree. I didn't know that. That's the kind of encouragement we're talking about. That is the kind of encouragement we're talking about. We're talking about being involved with each other enough to have given some authority to others to speak in our lives. And in this digital age, compacted, uh, made even more isolated by COVID, we have believed the lie that online community is community. We've believed the lie that speaking through our phones is genuine relationship. And we have become somehow, as a people, too busy to do a lot of things we used to do, right? Doesn't that seem right? All of a sudden, I don't have time for much of anything. I used to have time for this stuff. What happened? So I want to encourage you to be involved in each other's lives. And this is how you should start. You should start by planning to be at church more than 30 seconds before the first song starts. Come to church 15 minutes, 20 minutes earlier than it starts and hang out for a little bit. Talk to a few people. Or maybe hang out in between services if you have trouble waking up. So I'm going to go to first service. I'll hang out, wait for the people for the 11 o'clock service, talk to a few people, get to know a few people, and then, then jet. Okay? Hang around a little bit. Just spend some time. This will get us started in our relationships with one another. And so I want to encourage you because this is exactly what the writer of the Hebrews is encouraging us to encourage each other so that at some point in our relationships, we can come up to somebody and say, hey, how's it going? What's God been saying to you? Well, God told me to do this. Are you doing it? No. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. I know, I know, I know. Well, tell me how it goes this week. Okay? This is what he's talking about, encouraging one another to keep his... Because God understands that it is hard for us to steer our lives by his direction. We want to steer our lives by our own direction, our own wisdom. God asks us to give money, and that week everything breaks loose, and we got to pay this, this, and this, and this, and we decide by our own wisdom that we're not supposed to give this money. Wrong. You have just stepped into an unbelieving deceitful position where you are going to reject what God is directing in your life. And God knows it's hard, but we live in such provision, especially in America. So let's encourage each other to be obedient because it's hard for everybody. Beginning in verse 15, we have it again. The Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He says it again. This is, how, this is a one-point sermon. That's how important it is. And he highlights those who did not enter God's rest. Who rebels? Those that Moses let out, those that experienced God's salvation, those that saw his deliverance, those that saw his provision when things look impossible, we're in the middle of the desert, there's no water, all we have is a rock, and we get water out of a rock. These are the ones who rebelled. God was angry with those because they sinned and they disobeyed and they did not enter his rest. Those who would not steer their lives by God's direction are the ones who do not enter God's rest. 
They did not enter because despite believing in God, they got this far, right? They refused to obey and act on his promise. But the promise still stands. The promise is still there. And the writer says, be careful to be conducting your life by God's direction. We also have this promise given to us. We have had the good news of Jesus Christ proclaimed to us, and we have the 2020 hindsight of looking at this, what happened at Kadesh. We have this good news proclaimed to us, and the book of Hebrews up to this point talks primarily about how Jesus is greater. It begins, well, we have these angels, and they spoke to these people in the Old Testament, and these people saw them, and, but Jesus is greater. And we had Moses, and he led these people, and he was the only one who spoke to God face to face, but Jesus is greater. And the writer of Hebrews says, do not be deceived. If these people were held accountable for what they saw, us who have a greater revelation and a better picture are certainly going to be held accountable. Because Jesus is greater and the ultimate declaration of who God is. And this message had no value because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. So there's a direct reference to Joshua and Caleb. The message for the rest of the community was worthless because they did not have the faith of Joshua and Caleb. And the point is, if the gift is given to you and you don't pick it up and use it, it isn't worth anything. I have some trite sayings here that are recognition of this principle. Once all Villagers decided to pray for rain, and on the day of rain, everyone gathered, but only one boy came with an umbrella. That is faith. When you throw babies in the air, they laugh because they know you will catch them. That is trust. Every night, we go to bed without any assurance of being alive the next morning, but we still set our alarms to wake us up, that is hope. We plan big things for tomorrow in spite of having zero knowledge of the future, and that is confidence. And so you see, even those who do not believe recognize that action is required to be combined with your faith and your attitude. The writer says, today, he says, today, this singles a fresh opportunity to respond right now. Today, if you hear his voice. This call was not given to the people at Kadesh as a people who are wandering in the desert. It was given to a people whose pilgrimage was almost over, and they were on the verge of attaining the promise of God, and they rejected it. It is the same for us right now, today, if we hear his voice. We are community living in the unresolved tension of standing before the promise of God in a moment conditioned by trial and peril.
And the writer of Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, do not be like the community at Kadesh, just because it seemed hard, because they could not wrap their heads around how God was going to get it done. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in the midst of provision. We don't have to understand how God's going to get it done. We don't have to rely on American ingenuity and wisdom to move forward. Because God has placed it in our laps. All we have to do is pick it up and use it. And that's different for each person, what God is calling you to do. Some people God is calling to give, maybe to begin tithing. Maybe to give for something or someone that needs it. Someone might be wondering how they're going to get along with someone they work with. And God is calling you to reach out and draw near to that person. It's not for you to figure out how it's going to take place. God will take care of it. Do not reject God's plan for you. For obedience is a path to joy in this life. And this is about directing our lives not about our sins. I'm not saying they're not important, but not about our gossiping or, or our lying or whatever else sin we might possess. This is about allowing God to direct our everyday lives. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart.